the first question I had for you, not on the not on the paper, is if I want to start a cult like Mustachians, what are your pro tips? Man, that's a good question. And if I had prepared, I would have brought my little <laughs> talk that I gave a few years ago at a blogger conference that was called uh, Don't Start a Blog, Start a Cult. But anyway, I think the pro tips are you need to have a identifiable philosophy that's maybe a bit different than what the normal world is into. So because your people, your cult members are going to organize around this cult. So you maybe want just a little bit of a feeling of us versus them and like, oh, we are, you know, we got these values and they're noble, but but the other, the outside world doesn't um, quite support us. We're a little bit oppressed. So then you have this sense of identity And then this is all stuff I stumbled on accidentally because really I was just saying, here's a good idea for living. Yeah. And then other people like, yeah, I like that idea too, but nobody agrees with me. So that's why I accidentally had this slightly cult uh, thing going on. And other things that are useful, you know, a couple more pro tips would include like use of terminology and silly words. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's true with like, whether you're the cult of Star Trek or iPhone or the various religions, they all have these sort of special terminology. And it helps to have an identifiable leader too. So a cult yeah. uh, in which I <laughs> actually or worse. became. Yeah, but you got Steve Jobs or Captain Kirk or the leaders of the religions or the gods. All this stuff is, uh, is handy for creating a uh, cult. People think of a cult as a bad thing because they're thinking of Waco, Texas and Kool-Aid. But really, it's just a social organization structure, which is a basic built-in thing to human beings. And it's what allows us to live together and cooperate. So if you can make your brand or your company or your blog have these cult-like properties, then that's probably a good thing for making it last and have a having a real audience. How do you feel about the cult of Elon Musk? Well, I'm part of it. Okay. So <laughs> I think that's... Uh, I'm going to have a biased answer, but... It certainly fits the description that we were saying, um, that I was just saying now about what a cult is. And he's definitely an identifiable leader. He's definitely got unusual ideas. But the reason I am so much in this cult is everything that guy says or writes, I just agree with it so almost fully. And I really like the way he explains stuff. It's like, that. finally, someone is running... A company and instead of just spewing like this corporate bullshit like we are considering the needs of our customers and <laughs> we will get back you know he's always like no i think there's a bug in like the 3.0 software we'll get a release out yeah next week you know like it's proper he speaks like a combination of an engineer but with a much bigger perspective on everything and he has these clear goals so that's why i'm so favored you know and so far he's done very little um like evil you know, like maybe he has personal issues in the sense that he's, he's so driven that it's hard to relate to, to Elon Musk if you work directly for him. Mm-hmm. But his overall goals seem to be absolutely spot on for, you know, a good person. That's the kind of cult I want to be on. Well, I was curious if, if the cult leader, you know, needs to be like somewhat maniacal in their pursuit. Like they have to be polarizing to a certain extent. Probably a little bit, or they at least have to be so convinced that their way is is the way or a viable way that they're going to get some disagreement from some people. You know, in my personal views, for example, I've become more hardcore over the last year that cars are just like the biggest stupid inefficiency that we have in the United States. And we need to just cut that whole shit down by at least 90 percent. Mm-hmm. And uh, because 99% of people are completely car dependent, that makes me a polarizing figure. They're like, what is this crazy (laughs) bicycle sandals man trying to tell me to do? Like, it's just so different from anything I can imagine. So uh, in that way, that might be actually enhancing my um, status as an imaginary cult. Yeah. Well, are you (laughs) are you excited about self-driving cars? I I get the sense sometimes that they're just going to encourage mega commutes. Oh, yeah. Uh, That's a good question. Yeah even though it's a slight, um, you know, jump, I guess you were thinking Elon Musk and then you thought self-driving cars. So I think they're like a tool, but not the only tool. And right now, this is the the only place I disagree with the Elon Musk vision is that a car should be thought of as like a luxury racing wheelchair. (laughs) So there's times in your life you want a luxury racing wheelchair. For example, when you're with your friends and you're all going up into the mountains 
in like high altitude in a blizzard and you want to have some beers and your snowboards are in the back perfect time for a car um, but if you just want to go to work four miles or even 40 miles um, there's better ways to design your life you know mm. don't go 40 miles to work and uh, so yeah if, if we can keep the self-driving cars around so that they can reduce our crash rate and they can make our cities not be filled with inefficient parking lots mm -hmm. and that's a win but if you're just doing a mega commute from like pleasanton over to san francisco or something that's a loss and you're still wasting all this land to make giant roads and the cars themselves take way too much space um, because they're bigger than one person mm -hmm. so i would i hope that we can go both ways like denser cities bike friendly and then self-driving cars to eliminate the dumb stuff we do with cars now so we'll see. So one of the questions I was wondering is, you have a lot of software engineer, um, you know, cult members or followers, like entry level cult members. We'll just call them readers now okay. because we're we're done with <laughs> scaring people off with the cult label. Um, one of the questions I was curious about is, you know, for people who are interested in uh, retiring early or saving more of their money, you know, if you're living in a big city and say you're making like thirty grand. What is your advice for people like that? Um, yeah, because I know it's easier when you're making 150 to save save more of the money. Yeah, well, it's good to figure out why you're in that city in the first place because you can make $30,000 anywhere, including really affordable places or even working from home in, uh, in like the location of your choice in other countries. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing is like, are you willing to pay the premium to live in that city if you're actually going to make that wage that you could make just, you know, working as a manager at a, at a fast food place or something? And then the second choice is, or the second answer is, if that answer is yes, or regardless of the answer, what are you going to do with that money? Because there's always hacks you can do to get your living to be cheap or to get your food to be cheap. Um, there's a lot of people who live in San Francisco for little to no rent just through special arrangements, like they're friends with somebody who has a space or they're trading services for rent or they own a place and then Airbnb out the rest of it or whatever. So the less you earn in your regular job, the more valuable your time becomes in, in these frugality hacks of cutting down your expenses and figuring out how to get around for free and where to get the food that is um, good for you but not super expensive. Did you have a special arrangement? Because you moved to Colorado from Canada when you were just out of school, yeah? Um, no, I was. I worked a few years in Canada first. Okay. And so I did do a few things even back then. Like uh, instead of seeking out my own apartment, I was always splitting this these nicer, bigger houses. I would go on to the equivalent of Craigslist back then, the Usenet groups, find stuff for rent, uh, go there like in my best clothes and say, yeah, we would like to rent this place. There's several professionals, young professionals that would like to use the bedrooms. And then the, the owners are like, oh, okay, I guess we'll lend you our fancy house. And then all the all the boys would move in and uh, they were my co co-workers as engineers that were friends. So we'd split a four bedroom place among like four guys, for example. And then we would each pay $300 a month at the time when a, an apartment by yourself might be 700 so it was a win-win because we would have a much nicer place with a huge kitchen and a nice backyard. And then, but uh, for less cost than, than you'd pay for a junky beige apartment and on like the 13th floor. So I did that from the beginning. And then when I moved to the US, even back at the time, I was probably making in today's dollars, like close to $100,000. I still went straight to Craigslist and got a, a roommate situation for the first year because I had to save up a down payment. And eventually I bought a house and then uh, I've chosen to live in houses that I own since then. But um, it's not necessary. I could still do rentals. Uh, we just, you know, we spend more on our housing because we find it to be a nice luxury. It's one of our many indulgences. <laughs> now that you're at that point to afford it, I suppose. Yeah. And yeah. even earlier, like long before retirement, we yeah. still chose to live in a house. My girlfriend and I, now wife. So, um, yeah, we knew that. It's just something that was worth it to us. And my, because I like working on houses, it kind of paid for it as well because I was increasing the value in my hobby time, which makes it easier to sell your house for more later. Mm. And throughout this process, where, like, you know, when you were just starting to work, did you just happen to have, uh, you know, you weren't spending the money, so you were just looking for ways to take advantage of it as you were saving it? Like, why did you, why did you start connecting the dots and realize, like, 
what caused you to realize it, that you could retire early? Um, I probably started fairly early because I was a kid. Um, I was, I used to like iron my dollar bills when I was a kid and, and put them in a photo (laughs) album, like $5 for cutting the grass. I'd iron that five and stick it in. So I liked money as a concept, even when I was young. And then as I earned more money throughout my minimum wage jobs, I would not spend it all. And uh, although I did tend to blow it at the time because I didn't know about investment, so I would save up a bunch and then I'd buy like a dirt bike, a motorcycle. Okay. And then I'd save up for another year and then buy a really expensive stereo system or whatever. But then eventually one of those things was paying for my education. You know, I saved up for the first year of tuition, so I was getting a bit more reasonable. But then at around 19, someone handed me, like I think it was like a wealthy acquaintance of one of my sisters handed me this book on investing and wealth building. And I like burned through that whole thing in one day. And then I thought, ooh, investing is good. So then I kept reading books like that. And then I realized something else you could do with money. Yeah. So by the time I was in my 20s, it made sense that the surplus money would just go into investments. And at the time, to me, that just meant stock investments. And then I didn't do anything specially smart with them. But over after reading more books over the years, I started to do less dumb things. And then that's why I kind of settled on this index fund model. Mm-hmm for stock investing nowadays. In in that process of, you know, learning how to invest and getting going and, and then actually saving like what, 50%, 60%, 70% of your income, something like that? Yeah, that's what it was. Towards the end, we got over into the 60s because our income was going up, okay. but our household spending wasn't going up. Yeah, what, what, what did that feel like socializing? Because we, you know, we posted this to Twitter before we did the interview and a lot of people were really curious about the, the social implications of, um, you know, you're trying to put away 50% while your friends, you know, your coworkers make the same amount of money roughly. Um, what was that like? Well, at, at our level, it was pretty easy, you know, to be honest. It's kind of privileged when you have two tech salaries. You don't really have to give up any visible stuff in order. You can still go out to dinner. You can still have a ski pass and go skiing and everything. It was more in the, the hidden stuff that we cut out. For example, we would keep the same bike instead of upgrading our bikes all the time. And we would eat at eat lunch at our workplaces instead of going out to work and driving around all the time and waiting an hour just to say you could spend twenty dollars for lunch. Those kind of things don't cost you anything in social Mm. fun, but they're just more efficient. And similar with cars, like we would keep our used cars and our friends would buy new cars. Your friends don't care what kind of car you have. So you're not you're not getting any social cost by keeping your Honda Civic. When your friends have like a brand new, you know, top of the line BMW. So no, there was basically no pain. Yeah, I think this addresses like the the issue or rather the reason why so many people like your blog. It just feels much more relatable than many of the other early retirement blogs, which are, you know, like uh, live in your van, eat ramen noodles forever. Um, were those around as you started to save money and you just found it inaccessible or did you not even realize that that was a thing? Right. I didn't even know yeah, that okay. blogs existed, to be honest. And and there weren't really many blogs until the mid 2000s, maybe. And that's when I retired. So I, I just did everything in, according to my own strange values and then retired roughly uh, like at just before I turned 31. So that's why I still claim I retired at 30 and uh, <laughs> then lived that way for about six years before even thinking of writing this down in the form of a blog. Mm. And then when I did, eventually, uh, I went to the search engine and I typed like early retirement frugality. And then there was this blog called Early T- Retirement Extreme by this super great uh, frugal guy named Jacob. And I was like, crap, I can't start a blog. This is already covered. <laughs> yeah. So I totally, you know, I'm not going to waste my time duplicating it. But then I read his, his whole blog and I'd already written a bunch of articles kind of in advance, just stuff that I wanted to tell people. And uh, it turned out that we had different takes significantly enough that I thought I was still worth publishing. Yeah. And then Jacob and I ended up communicating quite a bit since then over the years. So yeah, I'm I'm glad I published, but uh, there weren't nearly as many financial and and retirement blogs, even when I started in 2011. than there are now, I feel like now we have thousands of them. Who are you looking up to at the time? I don't know if I really operate on a role model basis like that. I'm kind of more of a a strange like floating around by myself in the ideas sphere okay. so like i read books i was interested in, in the in the ideas in for example investing books yeah but i didn't really have any um 
personal lifestyle role models because I didn't read any blogs. It was just, you know, I'm just an independent guy. I had local friends, family, um, and I still don't really have any role models I clearly identify with and copy. I'm just interested if people are good at stuff they're doing, like the Elon Musk example we used before, then I, I follow their their progress and I think, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Hmm. Um, but it's so different from the, the quest that I'm on that I don't really have any role models exactly like in how to be Mr. Money Mustache, for hmm. example. <laughs> <laughs> and, there, and there wasn't even someone who you found was was kind of blazing their own trail and you're like, oh, you know, even like family members are like, oh, they kind of got it figured out. They're doing their own thing. Uh, no, I think that's maybe one of my advantages and disadvantages in life is that I don't even really look around to see what other people are doing. I just have these opinions <laughs> and sometimes they're considered quite crazy. And yeah. Other times people find use in what I do, but I, I'm kind of this, maybe I'm like a first principles person where I just look at something and I'm like, well, that's bullshit. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And other times I look at other things and I follow it. And uh, yeah, sometimes that gets me, uh, I'm a misfit in society because of this, you know, like giving, finding stuff to buy people exactly on their birthday, for example. I don't understand that tradition, <laughs> so I don't do it. And then other people who, you know, who expect that, they're like, well, that guy's not very thoughtful. He didn't kind get me kind anything of a on my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'll get, I'll do stuff for people when I, when I think of something they need or some service or help they need. So I'll do it um, whenever, not, I don't align it with the calendar stuff. So that's one example. I never understood fancy weddings is another one. Like I think marriage is a fine thing and parties are a great thing. So having a party for your marriage is great. But the whole thing with like special flowers and arrangements and table stuff, that seemed like nonsense to me. Especially, oh, and wedding rings. Oh, man. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're not wearing yeah. a wedding ring. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, I'm not against wedding rings, but okay. I, I, what I was thinking is the engagement ring, the whole tradition with like diamonds and expenses. I, I came across that later in life and I was like, man, that is total, total nonsense. Like, why, where did this tradition come from? So I just totally rejected it. Mm. Luckily, my girlfriend at the time also was a rejector of that, so it didn't cost me. Uh, <laughs> this is a super common question. People are like, you know, I'm, you know, following Mr. Money Mustache or, or anyone, and um, or I'm just personally like like you, and like I'm just on my own, interested in retiring, retiring early, interested in saving money. How do I get a partner on board? Like, do, oh, you, yeah. do you have thoughts there? Yeah. Well, it helps to pick that person in advance. So like there's two <laughs> strategies. There's you are already committed to somebody, who has certain values, and then that can go either way. They may be flexible, they may be diametrically opposed to you on this stuff, and so you gotta figure that out separately. But if you're still looking for a person or like in the circulating dating stage, um, finding someone who has these similar lifestyle values is awesome. Mm. And I've met so many couples now that are of that style, and they, they really are, they get along well. Mm. That's why, um, intra mustachian inter mustachian dating is really a good thing and when i when i have these events now and i see people getting together or even like on the forum uh, through my website it's a whole section are getting together right? yeah <laughs> yeah and actually there is an app coming out made by money mustache readers and the joke is that it's going to include a mustachian tinder feature <laughs> that's great and, um and i i was really adamant that that is a valuable thing because yeah. people want to meet each other and when they do when single mustachians meet each other which sounds silly because if you don't understand the word mustachian they're like well that's just that's just silly but basically what it really means is unusually thoughtful people that some have certain personality traits in common and they're often like to be honest quite clever because they, they're drawn from like tech workers or well-educated people for whatever reason that type of person has a hard time finding their same type, especially ones that aren't blown out completely in consumerism and, and spending all their money and no concern for environmental or resource stuff. So when they meet each other, the sparks really fly. So you might as well make that easier. If you're in my position, I would love to see I think more great. good relationships like that forming. Why do you think that, um, it, we talked about this a little bit, but why are, engineer types why are these clever types as you as you put it um interested in, in mr money mustache or interested in early retirement um maybe because they they like things to be logical and they might have the same tunnel vision that i have in the sense that they 
they don't just follow social norms. They try to evaluate things on a case-by-case basis. Like, do I like this tradition of society or do I like this one? And when they see somebody going through that same thought process, they, it, it resonates with them because that's not what you, it's not the same type of thing you'll see in like CNN news or, you know, or television shows and stuff. So well, maybe now with you, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if Mustachian is on CNN news, but everything else is very much like, let's take society as it is and then just talk about it. Whereas Mustachian principles is more like, let's take human nature based on what we understand as a science and adjust our lives so that it, they work well with our nature. You know, so society is kind of irrelevant. That's more like a byproduct that's just formed through random processes and you don't have to follow that. I mean, if your goal is happiness, just understand yourself as a creature. Every podcast always boils down to this concept, but yeah, we might as well just get into it right now. (laughs) Yeah. Understand yourself as a creature. And what's your goal? Well, that's living a happy life. What does that mean? It means having a series of happy days Mm -hmm. and then figure out how to have the experiences in your life that lead to as many happy days as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to be, that's not going to come from like car upgrades or following lame social traditions. It's more about um, thinking deeply about what makes you happy and then doing it. And it's this, it's not like what makes me happy is different from him or her. Like we actually have much more overlap in what makes us happy than we would care to admit. Mm-hmm. So that's where some of these fundamentals really get useful, you know? So, yeah, I mean, given that obviously you like uh, doing construction, you know, we're at the HQ, which we should talk about. Um, but with happiness, if, if more things are not in common than we think, what are the things that make you happy? And especially yeah. in the long, cause like, you know, if I, eating pizza makes me happy, but that's not like my retirement strategy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd say eating pizza doesn't make you happy. Eating pizza, <laughs> you know, makes you have like good, like sensual experiences, okay. you know, like your salt and sugar buds are all like nicely tingled. But if you, if you measure what happens in your happiness after like increasing your pizza consumption, so to do like a little experiment on yourself, are you actually happier after a month long of eating more pizza? Yeah. And cause it, cause there's other factors, right? There's your health and there's your activities you gave up in order to eat pizza and foods and everything. So the stuff we have in common though, is we, we have genuine social needs of a varying degree. So we like to be connected with people. We like to smile at people and feel valued. So that's that's the social side, which many people say is the most important. So you, you want to feel like you're part of a community and that people value you and that you're contributing to that community. You're not just taking. And it really helps to read books on this stuff. So if you can find books on somewhat scientifically based things for human happiness, just grab them from the library and read through them because it, chances are it'll blow your mind if you haven't been studying this. Mm-hmm. All right. So then... Um, Secondly, there's things like your personal health affects your happiness because it just changes the level of stuff that's circulating in your brain, like just the plain old dopamine and related chemicals. So like walking, eating salads, sounds kind of boring, but it genuinely makes you happier. And third, on the self-actualization level, like being able to create stuff that you're proud of. Mm. So working on something that's difficult, overcoming challenges, and then having something to show for it at the end and then continually doing that, that's a really big happiness boosting activity. So, um, and that's why TV shows, watching TV is not a life boosting activity. To a certain extent, it might have a second order effect of boosting happiness because you might get to talk about TV shows with your friends, so then you're creating that social bond. But if you throw that away, and instead, for example, using the construction example, I solve problems in my little construction projects And I do a lot of stuff with my physical body, which makes me healthier. Mm -hmm. And then I can bond over those activities with my other friends who are into that, like my carpenter friends, or I have a lot of kind of Renaissance men friends, you know, who like carpentry, but they also like nerdy science experiments and and money and engineering. So we can bond over like all the stuff we did in our construction projects and how that became a great rental house and how that became led to these neat experiences and then what the neighbors did in response. So you get all the whole happiness project satisfied, all pressing all the happiness buttons. Yeah. And that's why I keep doing construction is it's for me, it's like this super 
smoothie like you know power <laughs> thing that i can chug that makes me happy in so many ways and you kind of compartmentalize it we were talking earlier before we recorded about doing this alone in its similarities to engineering like the time it takes to get into a flow state and you know you need like a block of time right um do you try and, you know, like combine this stuff or have you just found it's much more satisfying to kind of, you know, this is your social checkbox. This is your like hard work, you know, working out or carpentry or whatever it might yeah. be. Yeah. I like, do try to um, put it in separate sections Yeah, and make sure they're all addressed. So okay. because it's uh, daily routines kind of make things happen automatically. And when you don't have a daily routine, it's easy to forget stuff that's important to you. So I've got, I've been in for at least the last six months since I bought this place, I've been a pretty neat daily routine where I get up, have a healthy breakfast, bike downtown where this building is, and then work for three or four hours, typically early when my family's still asleep for part of that time. So I'm, so, I'm getting all these buttons pressed, like physical health, problem solving, um, you know, having time to and I always listen to really good music while I do this too. Mm. So it's kind of like a nice Zen flow state. And then you have something to show for it at the end of it. You have more of your building done and you can be like, I can imagine people are going to enjoy this <laughs> feature later on when we open it up. Yeah. And then I bike back home and then I do family time where like I'm helping with my son and raising him and, you know, being a good dad and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then later on in the day, it'll be, you might have friends over or do some stuff to help your friends okay. with their projects. Yeah, because that was a question from Twitter. Uh, David Lang, I may be mispronouncing. Um, he's basically asking, you know, prior to HQ construction, did you have trouble finding this routine in your nine to five? Yeah, right. Like um, the daily routine. Yeah. When I do have a daily routine, that's when I am happiest, I find, because I've been retired for a long time. So I've kind of had ups and downs. Longer than you were working. Right. I might be at this point. Yeah. I guess full time. Been 12 years. Yeah. I've been 12 years since I quit real work. And then my total work career was about nine or 10 years, depending how you count for the early years. Mm -hmm. So you're right. And um, the times that I've been most happy have been when I have a, a routine like right now. I'm kind of on a, you know, really nice high point of my life's happiness, I would say, over the last six months and especially this month. Mm hmm. As I never really have any downs, but I have like different levels of up. <laughs> so this is a really high level of up. And I think it's because the routine has been really solid, like just super yeah. physical, lots of healthy stuff, not a lot of self-destructive things going on. Well, you're also bringing people together. Like you just had uh, two weeks of the pop-up business school, you know, helping right. other people get started. Like it's all converging. Like you're building a place to socialize. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So that really takes care of the social yeah. side because I had 85 people that I was hosting here in this building. So lots of talking and seeing other people be happy. Yeah. So that's obviously a pretty big advantage in making you feel like your life is worthwhile if you're surrounded by wonderful people yeah. who are in your, your life's kind of buzzing with activity. In fact, it got to be too much for a while and I had to take a whole weekend of just like sleeping in and eating salads because there was no productive uh personal time which which i find is one of my building blocks is like i need to do stuff alone and think and plan and and have time for all the thoughts to kind of go together and that's because i'm kind of a partial introvert in um in recovery time according to the susan cain book mm -hmm. quiet is mm -hmm. uh i recharge with quiet time whereas other people might recharge from like a Denver Broncos game or something like that. Yeah, I'm the same way. Um, do you do much long-term planning? Because obviously, you know, within the next year, this place will be mostly completed, right? Yeah. Do you plan on like what happens after that? I have a lot of tentative long-term plans. Like I, I like the idea of maybe expanding this place to take over another building um, so that we can just have a bigger co-working space. Or And then in the longer term, I have bunch of maybe ideas like, like can we start a town that's founded by on mustachian principles instead of car principles yeah but i don't put dates on these things until i'm really ready so i try to avoid like oh next year do you want to do something huge then i say well let's find out let's ask each other next year and see if we <laughs> and if we still like it then we'll put it like a week into our calendars a week in the future okay so i get stressed out a little bit with too much stuff on my calendar yeah there's one thing that makes me different than most people i've learned is i don't like planning lunch for next week or three weeks from now i like planning stuff less than 24 hours in advance 
according to a bigger picture though. Well, I appreciate you scheduling this a couple weeks yeah, in advance. <laughs> this was a, definitely an exception, but I just figured, you know, because there's nothing else I have planned this week, then it's probably okay for Craig Something. to come over <laughs> and podcast, but it could have gone either way. You know, I could have last night been like, shit, I can't believe I told Craig to come over for the podcast. I can't do that. I have other stuff to do. I could just take a weird turn right now. Um, so a handful of people asked online, like, what is the plan for the co-working space, the mustache and co-working space? Are you going to expand uh, into other locations, not just literally the building, like other cities? Yeah, <clears throat> that's similar to the question we just talked about, yeah. which is in theory, it sounds good. I definitely don't want to make any fixed plans on it, especially this is the first Monday the co-working space has even been open and for <laughs> normal people to just pop in and do some work. Uh-huh. So uh, it's if it continues to be fun for at least maybe six months or something, okay, or three even, then we'll know if uh, if it's worthwhile expanding. And if it did, then I can personally expand this to another building. Mm. And then another person asked in the question list, "Can we franchise this?" Because they like the idea of one being in their town. And the answer to that is probably as long as I don't have to do any of the work for it. <laughs> If we just come up with principles that work for yeah. what we're now calling Triple M headquarters and the principles are really just like a place to hang out and you're not milking people for as much money as you can by running it sort of cooperatively based, mm -hmm. um, then yeah, people can open them other, other places and I would support them in the sense of like making a directory yeah. of them so people can share with their community. The biggest obstacle to making this in any town is that you have to reach the people who are interested. And I had this advantage that I could just type some shit into the computer and then people immediately signed up. It's wild. And that's like a blog is a really, really useful thing for creating yeah. um, groups of people. And if the other people starting it don't have their own blog, that means my job would be to use mine blog, which is collectively yeah. help everybody who reads it to find the places. Well, that was kind of related to another question. Uh, on the expansion of mustachianism. So Lee Marshall asked, uh, if everyone in the world adopted it, would it help or hurt the U.S.? But I mean, I think you can expand that to the whole world. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on your definition of what they're adopting. Um, and early in the days of the blog, people would say, well, if everybody just put all their money in index funds and then quit working and then never did anything again productive, that would wreck our economy. And then in that case, I do agree because that would be, there would be no workers in the system and the stock values would be inflated because we right. would have <laughs> surplus demand for it. And yeah, of course that's not sustainable, but that's not really the definition of mustachianism or not even frugality. So what really happens is I'm an anti-waste blog, really. Like I'm not against spending money, but I'm against wasting money, especially when there's external effects. So like if someone says, should I fill up my 40 gallon diesel pickup truck and then drive up into the mountains to go ATVing all day? Like, no, that's a waste in so many ways. You know, you're burning up these vehicles, you're burning up the fuel, you're not getting any physical exercise and you're wrecking everybody else's life on the planet. So if, you, if less of that type of stuff happened, that doesn't hurt our economy at all. It just shrinks the fossil fuel section and the recreational motor vehicle section, which I would argue are just drains on human productivity really. Mm -hmm. Now, instead, if we spend our money on things like clean energy systems, you know, like instead of going ATVing, you could figure out solar panels and install them on your garage like, like I've done here. That's just one like kind of really overly obvious example. Or you could spend your money and time fixing stuff in your town that also brings you a lot of social fun and exercise and things, or you might build trails. And um, so anyway, when you have, when you get a lot of money saved up and invested, yeah. That's just really a psychological, you know, springboard to give you the freedom to do what you want to do with your life. Okay. But very few, few people um, quit being productive at that point. They, they just quit a job if they don't like it. Yeah. And then they typically will start another business doing something they like, or they'll start volunteering more or start being an interesting, better person in some other way. Yeah. Well, that was, that was actually one of the things that I also was interested in, you know, you were just saving the money while you were working. Um, and I think what's more common is to start a business, right? You know, you're like, okay, I have 200K in the bank. I can just go. Um, I forget the exact wording of the question. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, Greener Pastures asked, how do you balance mustachian frugality 
with spending to start and grow a business? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, if you think about Mustachian principles in starting a business, you might be more efficient in it. For example, you'd say, okay, I have a, a flower delivery business. A normal person might be saying like, okay, I'm going to buy the biggest six wheel pickup truck that I can and then put one little flower in the <laughs> truck bed and drive that around because that's a business vehicle. And Mustachian will say, well, I'm just going to buy like a I used Ford Transit Connect, these little like van cars mm -hmm. that are efficient and um, cheap on the used market. And so they're both accomplishing the same thing in, in flower delivery, mm -hmm. but one of them is spending six times more money than the other one. So, um, so that's, that's one, one partial answer to the question. And then the other thing is, um, if you think about cash flow quickly in your business, instead of like years of investment in, in hopes of finding your first customer, that's more of a risk to your money. Whereas if you think, how can I start my business small and go right to sales and then scale up only after I've proven it with sales, that's, uh, that reduces your, your risk. And that's kind of what the pop-up business school was about as well. Yeah. So one example that I didn't follow and I wish I had is when I quit working, I immediately started a construction company because I said, I love building stuff <laughs> and designing houses and I'm going to make some good I got decision. style, yeah. Yeah, so... So we borrowed money to buy land and then borrowed money to build these big 3,000 square foot houses. And then they had to sell before you could even get your money back, let alone make a profit. A much better design, a much better design for business would have been just grab your tool belt and make sure you have good tools with almost no investment and then find customers to do stylish renovations on their houses and then watch that cash flow build up. And if you still like it, then maybe you expand to building custom houses for existing people where they buy the land and they hire you as a builder. Mm -hmm. And then if you like that, then you might choose to expand by buying land and doing the craziest thing. But that would be only once you have so much money saved from it and so much confidence that it's not a big risk anymore. Right. So it's, yeah, it's all about lowering the risk and getting feedback along yeah. the way. Okay. Right. And I sure didn't know that when I first, even though I was supposedly kind of wise enough to have an early retirement, <laughs> I still blew it when it came to starting my own business. And it was stressful and terrible. And I lost a friend out of it, the business partner. So, uh, so yeah, it's, you don't, you don't automatically know everything. Do you get involved on the other side? So, um, Gabe.ai, it's just a Twitter handle, uh, asked you what you thought about angel investing. Do you, uh, do you ever get involved in that? It sounds neat. I have a, this guy named uh, a friend named Nords who has the early retirement for military retirees yeah. blog. Uh, and he talks about angel investing all the time and it sounds great, but his stories are the only thing I know about it. So um, apparently it's a good use of, you can think of it as like a, a business starting philanthropy if you don't make money on it <laughs> and then you can make money on it maybe as well okay. if you're good at it but he says you should think of your first hundred thousand dollars or more as tuition in angel investing school so i think it's a good use if you have the money but i wouldn't ad advise people to think of it as a money-making technique mm -hmm. unless they are passionate enough about it to be quite good at it mm, okay um and so basically what you do advise people and another person laurent asks um basically what are the skills that someone ought to build up? Uh, it's just at the bottom of that one. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you're, you're pro Vanguard index funds. Right. Uh, so that's an investment strategy. Uh, you're pro carpentry construction skills. Um, what are the other skills you advise someone to learn? I would say get good at anything that you get good at producing anything that you like consuming, especially if it's expensive. So you might not care about getting good at producing lettuce, for example, unless you're, <laughs> you're passionate about it. But if you really like having a car, then you should get good at understanding cars and how to buy them and how to maintain them if, if you drive enough that maintenance is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and then that part of your life can become free or even profitable. If you don't really care about cars and use them very much, then you might skip that skill and, for example, just use bikes or just have a cheap car that you minimally you put minimal money into it. And I'm, I'm passionate about housing. I like spaces and having a cool place for people to hang out and to host gatherings. So because of that, my skill at producing housing or buildings and maintaining them is more valuable than it would be for somebody who doesn't care about it. Cause I can create these things and I get houses effectively for free because 
by putting by finding them cheap and putting my labor into them then they can become profitable mm. so yeah basic skills instead of saying everybody should have the same basic skills it should it should really align with what you like to do um i mean i guess cooking might be kind of a a universal one because everybody most eats. people eat yeah <laughs> yeah so if you're really shitty at creating food but you really want to eat expensive food all the time and you just go to restaurants for it yeah that's a fundamental tax on your life unless you're good at making the money for that but most people specialize in buying restaurant meals and they don't have much income so that's a misalignment so it's no good (laughs) um and then what what about uh if you have kids what are you what skills are you focusing on teaching your son oh yeah so that's a good one and it's kind of like the last question so um Learning about parenting is a good thing if you have kids okay, and, yeah. and not following the necessarily the social norms about raising kids, because at least in wealthy areas of the U.S., there's this really weird tradition where people like to book up their kids and just have them do stuff all the time, like paid activities, and you have to drive them around town. And that makes no sense at all to me, because <laughs> kids... Right are learning machines like the reason kids are different than adults and the the reason they like playing and playing with each other and stuff is is because that's how they learn best is they need to be in an environment where they're stimulating stuff that they can figure out how it works and have new experiences and none of that is part of of kid evolutionary history like you know a forest (laughs) or this is why Lego is a good tool is it recreates a forest. It's yeah. stuff that you can put together to create different experiences. So I would say if you if you have kids, um, learn about learning mm-hmm. and don't fall into the trap of booking up your kid's life with organized activities because then you're depriving them of all the real learning that, that they're built to do. And do you have any like um, force mechanisms to ensure they're physically active or are you just kind of you know, you do stuff and he does stuff with you and that's just how it goes. Yeah, I try to make it, I try to make that happen because my son is very mentally based. Like he loves computers and he loves uh, computers. <laughs> <laughs> so, because uh, he's 11 now. So I try to, he, but he also, we get along really well. So he loves his dad. So I try to make myself not available for computer activities with him. And if he wants to do stuff with me, it has to be physical. So I'm like, well, we can go play Frisbee in the park behind our house, or we can go down and play at the creek where we bike, bike down to this natural area and do forest jungle jungle guy stuff. And so that's what how we get physical stuff more. And, you know, we encourage friends to do sporty things with them. And, uh, yeah, some kids are naturally drawn to team sports. And in that case, you should support it. But my son is like me and that he, he doesn't, he, he just doesn't go for it. He's like, well, why would I obey an adult's rules on how to play a game? Like, that's, that's lame. I want to invent my own game. Okay. So uh, I was always like that as a kid too. So I have to have sympathy for that. Yeah, I'm yeah. definitely a solo sport kind of person as well. Yeah. So he likes biking and he likes tree climbing and he, uh, hopefully he likes being strong. I think that's the real thing that will keep you out of trouble as you grow up is if you have a a desire to be healthy and strong then that that'll affect your your habits through the rest of your teenage years mm. i was kind of inspired as a kid by like arnold movies and stuff oh really yeah because <laughs> I, I like the idea of like the tough confident man yeah you know as a kid because i was nerdy so uh so that made got me into like the whole physical training and bodybuilding stuff yeah and not that i was like a bodybuilder but I, that was just in, inspiring to me so i lived that way where i was like you know getting exercise and and working on my health and stuff and that really helped me avoid stuff that happens to people at my age now if i hadn't been like that throughout my life yeah one pound a year and then it's a lot from 20 to 60 yeah right yeah (laughs) um and so what about uh what about his education do you have any thoughts on you know should he go to college should he focus on you know obviously he's into computers should he be an engineer do you uh do you guide him in any way there I would say no. Like we definitely have explained the university model and why it was good for us parents. And uh, and then it's up to him to decide if it's good for him because the stuff has changed so much. The world of jobs and businesses, the internet has blown it apart to yeah. a degree that most people don't understand. But as I've become uh, more of an internet person myself and I see all the businesses that exist out there, it, 
turns out almost everything is possible mm. without schooling, formal schooling. You can probably do it better and learn it better yourself. It's only like the most traditional professions now, like medicine and other like l certain types of law that yeah. require this really formal stuff. Yeah. Um, and if you're a self-guided person, like I think my son is, he might not have the patience or the desire to go into any kind of traditional thing. He's like, I want to create what I want to create and sell it to whoever is interested in it. Yeah. So I don't mind if he doesn't go to formal uh, university. If he does, I, I'll definitely support him in that way too. But I would never force him because, you know, we're, he's, it's so easy to make a living in so many different ways that it's not, there's no stress like, oh, you got to do this or you're going to be in the ditch okay. living. And, <laughs> and by support him, you mean support him uh, not financially? You mean mentally? Just like Well, I, I mean, we would certainly pay for whatever needs to be paid for. I so do if you wanted to go to a fancy liberal arts, you know, 70000 or $100,000 a year school by the time he's 18, you're like, all right, I'm in? Well, if there were, we would talk about that with him. Okay. You know, like, I mean... First of all, I think it's good for kids to pay for their own education to the most degree that they can because you, it's good to understand the money part of it. And secondly, that sounds like kind of a, you know, that's beyond, because school kind of has like this exponential thing at the top of the cost where you get into ridiculous costs for no reason, like the private ones. Mm -hmm. Whereas you can go to like the Harvard, the Ivy League schools for pretty much free if you're good enough to get in, then you generally don't have to pay a huge amount mm -hmm. to to do it. So that would be another thing I'd encourage. But let's say hypothetically, like the only path that will make him have the best life is to pay the super tuition for this thing and he can't pay for it himself, then yes, we would pay for it. Okay. In our in this situation, because we've come into extra money, um, in our old situation, if I hadn't, you know, if I was living off twenty five thousand dollars a year and just had like the $1 million of savings and had never done any more work mm -hmm. to build it, then we would say, no, we can't afford it. So we're not gonna go into debt to pay for your school. Okay. So I think that's a valid thing for parents to do. They should not pretend that they're multimillionaires just because that's the American standard. Mm -hmm. People should pay for, they should buy the schooling that they can afford. I think it's really valuable for a kid to figure out how much it actually costs before you, you know, sign the check. Like, yeah, this month is my last month of uh, expensive NYU student loan payments. And so uh, it's become much clearer how expensive it was those four years. Yeah. After the fact. Yeah. People really students don't really see the dollars. I just see it like vaguely. In it's an just account. a number. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you should learn that from the beginning. I remember my first year of school, which I was paying for mostly myself. I went in with the attitude that you probably did where I was like, oh yeah, I guess these are the books I need. I'll just put them on the, on the account or whatever. And then I was like, vaguely had this vague feeling, man, this physics textbook is $89. That sounds like a lot, but I guess that's what you do. Yeah. But then by the end of that year, I thought you could just sell them back to the bookstore but you can't. The bookstore is like, yeah, we'll give you five bucks for that one. And this one's obsolete. And I was like, are We're you using kidding? the next version. Yeah. yeah Physics stole, has changed. <laughs> yeah. I was so mad. You stole my money. Ah. So then from that point on, I would look at it. I was like, no, books are five bucks. Like, I'm not going to buy this thing. And I would like share textbooks with multiple friends. And we would photocopy them and have these nice binders of well-printed yeah. shared books. Yeah. Because that was my money. You know, I was like, $89. That takes me nine hours at minimum wage to make that back in high school so i'm not going to spend that just to just to have a giant book that's should be on a, a digital format anyway because mm -hmm. at that time digital stuff was already invented even though it was a long time ago so uh, why are they even giving us paper books yeah so you got to get mad when things are expensive <laughs> like housing like you don't stay in the dorm room unless it's competitive with off-campus rentals mm. and sharing with roommates and in both price and quality mm. so and you don't have a car when you're a student because you don't have any money cars are a rich luxury person's gas-powered racing wheelchair so why should you have one when you don't even have enough money to pay cash for your for your student uh yeah for your courses so that kind of stuff cuts your bills a lot big time yeah i, I mean i think uh folks who take this gap year between high school and university if they choose to do it super valuable for many reasons and that's one of them like you see how much work it actually takes to pay for a you know 50 grand a year education yeah if it's a gap working year i mean i've yeah. also heard of taking gap years to travel to go drink beers with, in thailand yeah, <laughs> yeah. Without, with other people's money and that's also something i was 
against as a kid. So this is where my non-privileged upbringing probably turned out to be an advantage because I was thinking, well, I, how could people go traveling? Like that costs money, which I don't have. So that's automatically <laughs> out of the question. And secondly, I need to get to the other side of this hump of the engineering degree because that's where the money is. So I'm going to start as soon as possible. Mm. I don't want to delay it at all because then I won't have the money ever. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great point. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious what, what you think about planning for the future, given that you have such an influence now among, you know, millions of people, you know, if, if the, well, I assume millions of people. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's, <laughs> I would like to know the real number, but let's just say there's, if there is influence, then yeah. What's the exact question? Well, How I'm, do I plan I'm, for it? Well, you're, because you can kind of be prescriptive to a certain extent. Um, you know, say, you know, climate change happens or maybe the U.S. economy doesn't necessarily like keep up the pace it has been. Um, what, how do you feel about that? How do you, how do you plan for it? And how do you recommend other people plan for it? Oh, right. You mean, so if things are not perfect, like they have been since the last recession, since we came out of it, um, yeah. How do you make your life, uh, anti-fragile, I guess you could say. And luckily the, the same principles that get you to early retirement in good times are the same ones that make you more crash proof in bad times. So, which is not designing a bunch of costs into your life that don't have to be there and not, um, you know, not compromising your health because that's just another cost. If you're, if you get sick or if you're less productive because you're less healthy. Mm -hmm. So all the basic principles of mustache, like building multiple skills, reduce, so that increases your production, um, living to live, learning to live efficiently. So that decreases your consumption hanging out, you know, building social connections with people of all different sorts. So you have like a mesh of people to lean on and that you can help. All that stuff is the same things we would do in the event of a zombie apocalypse as well. So it works in all, in all times. Okay, cool. Um, well, I, I think we're good. Uh, do you have any closing words for uh, mustachians or people on the road to early retirement? Oh man, you just sprung that one on me. No, I don't have any closing words. I'm just a, I'm, <laughs> general words as they go as life goes on type of person so okay i'll be uh the next time i have words they will appear on the blog <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks man thank you